I think it's going to be very important. The new House majority provides a check on the Biden administration, does the proper oversight and the investigations that need to be done for the American people, but I think it's also going to be important that they provide a positive agenda for how we bring back the economy, secure the border, secure the country for the future. Well, the American people deserve answers about what happened. I, I was one of those passengers uh, uh, waiting at the Indianapolis airport to come to Washington, D.C. for the day. And uh, uh, we, we simply have to have confidence uh, that the FAA and that our public transportation system and our airways are operating with the highest and most efficient technology. And uh, uh, I'm calling on the Biden administration and I'm calling on the Department of Transportation uh, to demand that our airlines have that technology. And in this instance, the American people deserve answers. To my knowledge, this was the first national ground stop since 9-11. Uh, and uh, the, the American people deserve to know why it took place, what happened, and also what's being done to ensure that we have the redundancy in the system to make sure this never happens again. Well, I'm, uh, I was grateful to see Speaker Kevin McCarthy elected as the 55th Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. He is going to lead with skill and integrity uh, and conservative principles that the American people voted to begin to return our country to in the 2022 election. I have every confidence in him and in Leader Scalise uh, and in this new conservative majority that they're going to deliver on the promises that they made to the American people. They're going to provide a check on the runaway spending and liberal policies of the Biden administration. Uh, they're going to do the oversight to hold the Biden administration accountable and conduct the kind of investigations uh, that will give the American people the answers, whether it be the politicization uh, that we've seen in our Justice Department in recent years or a broad range of issues. That accountability is important. But I'm also confident that Speaker McCarthy and this new conservative majority are also going to be piling on Chuck Schumer's desk in the Senate solutions to the challenges that are facing the American people, how we get this economy moving again, how we get 40-year uh, high inflation uh, under control, how we secure our border, deal with the crime wave uh, in our cities, and uh, provide our military with the support that they need to defend this nation. It's those solutions that I think the American people are going to be counting on House Republicans to deliver. Uh, and last week's uh, debate uh, last week's 15 votes speaker of the house i think revealed that we have a new energetic majority uh, we have a majority that is committed uh, to, to leaving behind business as usual in washington dc and and i commend uh, uh, speaker mccarthy and leader scalise and all of the members for finding a way to come together but i also uh, i also commend uh, the House conservatives that stood for the kind of reforms that will bring greater transparency and, and I think greater protections for taxpayers uh, in, the, in the spending process in the Congress. The changes that were demanded and negotiated I think are going to benefit taxpayers in the long term. Well, you know, as I wrote about my autobiography, I was... Uh, I was the leader of House Conservatives during my years in the Congress of the United States. And uh, I took on a president of my own party on big spending issues and, and, and fought against big government republicanism in my day. And uh, I, for one, am confident uh, that this new energetic conservative majority showed last week that they're, they're willing to stand for what they believe in, but also able to come together and move forward solutions that will really put our country back on a track, not just for economic growth, but for the kind of fiscal responsibility that, that will uh, uh, put us on a pathway to a balanced federal budget again. Well, when it comes to the debt ceiling vote, it's extremely important to remember that we need to uphold the full faith and credit of the United States. That's an obligation uh, that our nation has. 
But I think House Republicans would do well to use that opportunity to demand the Democrats in the Senate and the Biden administration step forward with the kind of reforms that will begin us on a process of solving the problems the American people are, are living in every day. We, we've, we've got to turn off the gusher of spending in Washington, D.C. I think demanding that we rescind some of the trillions of dollars in runaway spending that have occurred just in the last two years under the Biden administration. I think, I think demanding that this administration secure our border, finish the wall, uh, implement the Remain in Mexico policy, sustain Title 42, all the policies that worked under the Trump-Pence administration that reduced illegal immigration by 90 percent. And I think the leverage of that debt ceiling vote uh, ought to be focused on delivering progress for the American people on 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 what families are struggling with every day. You know, not not living in Washington, D.C. anymore. I'm back in Indiana. You know, I get to drive my own car, I shop at the grocery store, talk to my neighbors and friends. And I got to tell you, I mean, people are hurting in this economy. People are worried about the crisis at our southern border. They're worried about crime uh, in the streets. And they're worried, frankly, about the long range debt. We have, we have debt now the size of the entire American GDP. And I think the American people want to see House Republicans use that moment and the whole of this session of Congress to begin to set forward policies that will actually bring relief to the American people on the challenges that we're facing today. But also, as I said, I think it's important that House Republicans lay out a foundation to really set our nation back on a path to a balanced federal budget, and that will require visionary reforms, even while we keep our promises to seniors and provide for our common defense. I think the oversight role of the House of Representatives is an important role, uh, and I wholly support uh, the House of Representatives getting the American people answers uh, on the question of the Hunter Biden laptop. I, I will tell you that, uh, and I wrote about it in my book, but I, I, thought, uh, I thought it was a disgrace uh, that the national media literally censored uh, stories about the Hunter Biden laptop in the month before our, our re-election approached. And, and it's extraordinary that it would be a year and a half later that every major news organization in the country acknowledged that, in fact, that was Hunter Biden's laptop and the emails were real. But the suppression of that, the censorship of that, I, I think the Congress would do well to deeply examine uh, the role of big tech, the role of, uh, of the Biden administration and the Biden family and their allies in the media in, in suppressing that information uh, to the American people. But th there's a range of issues that I think are important for the Congress to investigate and, and understand. The American people deserve that check and balance in our system that a new House Republican majority can provide. But that being said, I don't think that's to the exclusion of producing policies that will get the economy back on track, set us back on a strong fiscal footing, uh, secure our border, and bring, bring real solutions to the American people. House Republicans can do both, and I believe House Republicans will do both. I campaigned in 35 states for men and women, for the House and Senate, and I'm pro-life. I don't apologize for it. I think there's no more important cause than the cause of life. And I believe one of the great accomplishments of the Trump-Pence administration was that we appointed three uh, of the justices that were part of a majority that gave the American people a new beginning for life and returned the question of abortion to the states and to the American people. But what I saw in the last election was that men and women who clearly articulated their position on the sanctity of life uh, did quite well in their election. But candidates on our side that shied away from it and allowed the Democrats 
who hold a radical position of abortion, abortion on demand all the way up to the moment of birth. Democrats support taxpayer funding of abortion. But, but uh, Republican candidates who allow Democrats to take attention away from their radical position on abortion uh, and define the Republican position uh, did not fare as well. And so I think going forward, it's going to be incumbent on the men and women on our party to stand without apology for the sanctity of human life, to stand on that principle um, of the unalienable right to life, but also uh, to express compassion uh, for women that are facing crisis pregnancies. And I think you're going to continue to see uh, in states around the country and in the Congress efforts to advance the cause of life, but also expand support uh, for uh, for, for unborn children, for women facing crisis pregnancies, and for newborn children. I think, I, I truly do believe. It may take us as long to restore the right to life in this nation as it did to overturn Roe v. Wade, but uh, I think it all, it all begins with having leaders that are willing to stand up and state clearly where they are on the right to life. And I think the elections proved that, that our candidates that spoke without apology about the right to life. It spoke with compassion for the unborn and for women in crisis pregnancies did well. People that shied away from it and let the liberal Democrats define their position did not. Well, let me say when I look at the midterm elections, my conclusion is that our candidates that were focused on the future did very well. The candidates that were focused on the past, particularly candidates that were focused on relitigating the past, did not fare as well. There were many races around the country that we should have won that we lost. There were races that we had hoped to win that came up short. And it seemed to me consistently the common denominator was that our candidates that were focused on the future and bringing solutions to the challenges that the American people are facing under the failed policies of the Biden administration at home and abroad were very successful. And so I, I, don't, I, I don't know what the president's intention is, his conclusion was. My conclusion was uh, that uh, the lesson of the 22 election was that Republicans that, that will stand on principle, articulate those principles, and focus on solutions in the future to the challenges facing the American people. Uh, we're rewarded with the opportunity to lead, and I'm confident that'll be true in the future. Let me say, I, 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 uh, I want to leave that decision to the members of the RNC. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for Chairman McDaniel's work uh, she's been a friend uh, for many years, but uh, uh, I'm a big believer uh, that our national committee men and committee women will be able to sort that out. We'll let them do that, and I'm going to continue to focus on trying to move policies forward and marshal support around the country for an agenda to bring this country back. You know, years ago, someone said to me that there's two kinds of people in politics. There's, a, there's people that are called and people that are driven. And uh, if you read my autobiography, you'll find out I, I've been both. Um, uh, as a young man starting out in politics, I allowed my ambition to get ahead of my values and my priorities and, and ran some disappointing campaigns. But over the last 20 years, for Karen and me, it's always been about a calling. Uh, we try and be sensitive to what we feel that God is calling us to do, what our countrymen are calling us to do. Uh, and, uh, and that's how we'll approach this decision. I, I can tell you, traveling around the country over the last two years, I'm, uh, I'm more convinced than ever uh, that this is a great nation uh, filled with good people. We just got to have government as good as our people again. And as over the coming months, we're going to continue to travel. Uh, we're going to continue to listen very intently, and uh, uh, we'll make a decision, I'm sure, in the, in the months ahead about what role we might play, whether it be as a national candidate or as a voice for our conservative values. But uh, I'll keep you posted.
Well, the only decision I made for sure is that we're not going to let anybody else make our decision for us. And look, it's a free country. Um, President Trump had every right to announce uh, a campaign to seek the presidency again. And, and let me be clear, as, uh, as I wrote in my book, I don't, I don't think anybody could have defeated Hillary Clinton other than Donald Trump in 2016. But I, I believe that uh, Republican voters are looking for a new style of leadership in 2024. Not new issues, not new priorities. Everywhere I've gone the last two years, one American after another has told me that they want to get back to the policies of the Trump-Pence administration, policies that rebuild our military, revived our economy, unleashed American energy, saw conservatives appointed to our courts that would respect a life and, and our liberties. Uh, but I also hear people saying that they want us to move uh, to a politics that reflects the civility and respect uh, that Americans of diverse views show each other every day. You know, I tell people, you know, once you get about 15 miles out of Washington, D.C., people in this country actually get along pretty well most days. It's our, our politics is more divided than ever, ever before. But I'm not convinced the American people are as divided as our politics. And I, I, think, I think they long for leadership that will stand on principle, but articulate it in a way that at least has the chance of bringing people together around our highest ideals. And at the end of the day, I, I, I think uh, it's a new day. I think it calls for new leadership. And uh, I have every confidence that uh, the American people and Republican voters will, will have better choices come 2024. I couldn't be more proud of what the American people accomplished during the course of the worst pandemic in a hundred years. I mean, in a very short period of time, because of American innovation, we reinvented testing from a standing start. We saw the, the creation and distribution of billions of medical supplies. We saw medical workers around the country step into the gap uh, without regard to their personal safety. And we saw the development of two safe and effective vaccines in record time, in just nine months that I know saved millions of lives. But all along the way, our focus was always on advancing policies to confront the COVID pandemic that preserved freedom. And the Biden administration was categorically wrong in embracing vaccine mandates on the American people. Fortunately, our conservative majority on the Supreme Court threw out most of their vaccine mandate. But I must tell you that the fact that uh, that, that vaccine mandate continued for men and women in our armed forces and continues to this day for health care workers, uh, I think is, um, I, I, I think it's a great disservice to people who step forward to serve this country in uniform, and it's even a greater disservice to the men and women who work in health care who are still living under a vaccine mandate today. Um, I mean, if you think about it, during that first year when I was leading the White House Coronavirus Task Force, we asked doctors and nurses and healthcare workers and administrators and to continue to go to work. We didn't know exactly the dangers of this virus, but we needed them to continue to go to work without medicines, without a vaccine, and they didn't hesitate. Now, I know of no incident where a healthcare worker said that they were going to put their own health above someone else's health. It was deeply inspiring to me. And now the fact that we have healthcare workers in this country who've lost their job because they have refused to take a vaccine is just unconscionable to me, and it ought to be rescinded. But with regard to our armed forces, I, I, I say this as a former vice president, uh, having led the task force for COVID, but also as the father of a United States Marine and the father-in-law of a Navy pilot. Um, I think it was unconscionable that the Biden administration mandated a vaccine on members of the armed forces of the United States. And I, and I celebrate uh, Congress' recent decision to rescind that, that mandate. But that doesn't go far enough. I think now that uh, Secretary Austin has implemented what Congress passed into law, lifting the vaccine mandate on members of our armed forces, 
now I'm calling on the Biden administration and the Pentagon to reinstate every man and woman that was discharged from our armed forces because they refused to take the vaccine and give them 100% back pay for the time after they were discharged. I mean, the men and women who serve in the armed forces of the United States are the best of us. Uh, and the very idea that that we uh, uh, that that we that we put people in a position to choose between serving their country uh, and taking a mandate was just unconscionable to me. And I again, I I welcome the change in the National Defense Authorization Act that ended the vaccine mandate for members of our military. But now it's important now that the Congress and the Biden administration take the next step, and that is reinstate every man and woman that was discharged in the military over refusing the vaccine mandate and, and, and give them 100% back pay the day they arrive. I think Operation Warp Speed was a medical miracle. The fact that we brought together all the great research companies in the country, heard from them that it usually takes five to seven years to develop a vaccine in those early challenging days of the pandemic in, in March of 2020, and said to them that that's not good enough, you have to do better. And Operation Warp Speed was born, where we allowed companies to develop and test vaccines even while the government was was paying for those vaccines to be produced so that the moment that one vaccine was found to be safe and effective it would be made available to the public and i have no doubt that providing those safe and effective vaccines in record time uh, saved lives all across this country i mean for, for men and women that were either had, had a physical or uh, condition or a comorbidity that created a vulnerability to serious outcomes with COVID. I know the vaccines were of enormous benefit, but I, I must tell you, I, again, I, we never supported a vaccine mandate, uh, and and I understand the concern uh, the people in this country have about the vaccines, but I, I really believe it ultimately finds its its origins in 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 the fact that. That, that a vaccine mandate came along and people were required to take it. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm all for transparency. I'm proud of what Operation Warp Speed accomplished. But, um, but I, I think the time has come for us to continue to move forward, continue to innovate, develop additional therapeutics, which this administration is largely blocking through the bureaucratic mechanisms. Uh, and, uh, but get back to principles of freedom and give the American people the tools to confront not just this virus, but other diseases and, of course, the country, but, but to do that uh, in an environment of freedom. Trump-Pence administration changed the national consensus on China. And now Americans of every political background understand that China is the greatest threat to our country, economy, and security in the 21st century. Uh, and uh, uh, the answer is strength. I mean, after two years of, of budget cuts in defense spending, uh, I, I welcome uh, the Congress's efforts to catch back up on our efforts to rebuild the military in the recent defense bill, but we still have a long way to go. And China is literally investing uh, billions of dollars in continuing to expand uh, their military. They're continuing to engage in the kind of aggressive behavior, not just in the Taiwan Straits, uh, but in the in the South China Seas and uh, and 
their menacing behavior is, is, is reflected, the only answer to that is American strength. I mean, peace comes through strength, but weakness arouses evil. And we, we cannot send a message of weakness in the Asia Pacific, or we will continue to see greater and greater provocations by communist China. Um, with regard to Taiwan, I, I think it's just imperative that uh, we provide Taiwan with the arms necessary to defend themselves. The truth is that Taiwan is, is, a, is a free people, it's a democratic people. Um, we've had that strategic ambiguity in for decades, uh, but I think we need to keep our treaty obligations and uh, make Taiwan uh, 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 make Taiwan uh, uh, the the, uh, the arsenal that uh, is necessary to defend that freedom that they've practiced uh, and won over the decades. Well, in my years as vice president, I met Vladimir Putin. I looked him right in the eye and told him things he didn't want to hear. And my one conclusion was Putin only understands power. And the United States has been right in the last year to answer Russian aggression with American strength, marshalling our allies and giving the Ukrainian people the ability to defend themselves and defend their sovereignty. And we must continue to do that. Anyone that thinks that Putin will stop if he, if he prevails in the war in Ukraine has, as we like to say in Indiana, another think coming. And the reality is that uh, in our first year in office, I was, I was dispatched to Eastern Europe to, uh, to visit uh, Estonia and Latvia. and. Uh, uh, nations that to this day are not uh, uh, are not yet in in a position of great security. I've sensed great anxiety at that time. There were hun over a hundred thousand Russian forces marshaled along Eastern Europe uh, in 2017. Uh, but our administration was the only administration in the 21st century where Russia did not attempt to redraw international lines by force. And I don't think that was a coincidence. I don't think it was luck. I think it was a function of American strength. They, what, what Putin saw under the Trump-Pence administration were record investments in our military. We allowed our armed forces to take down ISIS and their leader. Uh, we took down Qasem Soleimani, the most dangerous terrorist in the world. And we struck Syria not once but twice when they used chemical weapons on their own people where the last administration had failed to do those things. Um, I think Putin saw strength in the American Armed Forces and strength in the United States uh, during our years in the White House. But uh, uh, with this administration, with the disastrous withdrawal in Afghanistan, uh, with uh, attempts to appease and capitulate uh, to Iran, to entice them back into the Iran nuclear deal, I think there's been a message of weakness sent on the world stage. And uh, uh, I truly do believe that whatever the outcome, it needs to be driven ultimately by the decisions of the people of Ukraine, and it needs to be driven from putting them in a position uh, of strength. That, uh, but we need to stand with them until uh, un until Russia is driven from Ukrainian soil, uh, or or peace is reestablished. Uh, I'm not concerned that the House Republican majority will waver in their support of Ukraine. I, look, I, I welcome accountability, um, and Speaker McCarthy's been clear that it's just not a blank check. We, the American people expect us to be careful about how our resources are being spent uh, with any of our allies, but I, I truly do believe that Republicans in the Congress uh, and across this country understand that America is the leader of the free world. Uh, and that we simply cannot stand on the sidelines uh, when we see uh, uh, Russia attempting to redraw international lines by force. We, we've got to continue to lead the free world. We've got to continue to provide support. I have every confidence that uh, 
that Republicans in the Congress uh, and around the country will continue to support that um, and, um, and hold the banner of freedom high. Over the last two years, I think I was in 35 states campaigning for candidates, and um, I've been very encouraged at the interest in our work at uh, this American Freedom Foundation, also been very humbled at the interest in our book, and so we're going to continue to travel very aggressively. Um, from our home in Indiana, we're going to continue to listen, and uh, in the months ahead, we're going to discern um, where I and my family might best contribute to the life of the nation. But I'm, I'm very confident about the future. I'm very confident that uh, what we saw in 2022 uh, was that the American people want to see our country come back uh, to the policies that we put into effect in the Trump-Pence administration, policies that left our country uh, stronger, more secure, more prosperous than any time in my lifetime. And. Uh, uh, I'm confident that we'll produce candidates at the national level, uh, in states across the country, for the House, the Senate, and governors that will articulate that vision. And I think the best days for the GOP and for America are yet to come. Mm -hmm.